They don't realize that in the end, there's only going to be emptiness, disappointment, and destruction. Right? If you're not being driven by God, if he's not the motivation of your life, whatever you're being driven by or whatever you're following is going to end up in disappointment. And Paul is just super excited here because he sees that that's not the case in this church in Thessalonica. There's something genuine going on there. They were being driven by the power of God in their lives. Now, the epitome of the muscle car, right? What is it? Well, you might have various answers, but one of them at least would be, and Stephen would agree with me, the Dodge Charger, the Dodge Challenger, right? The Hellcat, one has close to 800 horsepower, the fastest and most powerful mass-produced sedan in the world. The news is, next year is the last year they're going to produce them. Because we're going to come up with an e-car that's a muscle car. But when you talk about power, that's where it's at. Now, when a person is first saved, do you remember back to when you were first saved? Remember how zealous for God you were? You were seeking to serve Him with all your strength? Even though you didn't really understand everything. It wasn't that you just didn't understand the Trinity, which none of us are going to completely understand, right? It's you didn't even understand some of the basic things about Christianity, but you still just wanted to go talk to people about Jesus. You were so excited about it. It was like you were driving a Dodge Charger down the road. It's like, get out of their way. They have a purpose. Something has changed in that person's life, right? They, they just knew one thing. They just knew this, that they encountered the living God and he had changed their lives. That's what they knew. They may not be able to explain it, but God had done something in their life. And if you're saved this morning, you know that's true in your life. God did something in your life. God changed you. You're not the same person that, you're used, that you used to be. But sometimes down the road as believers, there's a temptation for us to be pulled away from that zeal for Jesus by these other things, right? Things pop up and somehow we get distracted and we, we kind of get off the road and we unknowingly trade in our Dodge Charger for a, max, a Matchbox version, a Hot Wheeled version, which resembles the real thing, but it's only a toy. And so our life all of a sudden runs out of motivation and energy. Because we're no longer driving this supercharged car, we're just holding this little matchbox. Whatever that little idol is that we're, that we're turning to, whatever it is that we're trying to pursue and find satisfaction from, but there's no real power there. Young people are often driven by their pursuit of fun in good times. Let's just have fun, right? Young adults to middle-aged adults sometimes are are driven by many things, but one of the things they could be driven by is their career path. Just get on the career path, and everything's focused on that, and that is everything to them. Older people like me can get obsessed with retirement. What's that going to look like? You know, will I have enough money? I mean, to do this and do this and do this, right? And we can, we can, none of these things are bad, but they can bump our focus on the Lord so that we're no longer letting his will drive us, but we're getting detoured into and down, going down these alleys because we think there's something else that we have to really figure out and fix. And as a church, we've said that our mission is worship and service, which means we are on mission together, making disciples, so that more people are worshiping God and more people are serving God. Which means that we need to be worshiping God and serving God. And as we're worshiping God and serving God, we are then trying to make disciples by by uh, reaching people with the gospel, by beaching them, which we've said is that assimilation process of trying to people, bring people into the church, and baptize and identify themselves with a particular local church, and then the teaching aspect, which is this ongoing discipleship. That's what's driving us as believers. We're on mission. We're on mission because we need more people worshiping God and serving Him as we do that ourselves. So, in this book this morning, we're going to start out, and we're going to see a picture of a healthy church. And in this passage specifically, we're going to see a portrait of healthy believers, which is what makes a healthy church possible. It's a group of people that are demonstrating real life change powered by God through the gospel. That's what it's about. Now for Paul, 
his reality was found in God. God had just totally turned his life upside down. It was all about God. Now, God had done some special things in his life because he was called to be an apostle. But as Jim Berg says in his book, Changes His Image, which many of you have been going through, life is not supposed to make sense unless God is at the center of it. If God isn't at the center of your life, it's not going to make sense. Now, we see in the beginning of this letter the emphasis on God. Paul, first of all, in verse 1, addresses this letter to the church that is in God. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. They were in God. That's what made this group special. He was always thanking God for them. Right? He, the first thing he, the first person he thinks about thanking is who? It's God. Because his world revolves around God. He recalls their lives well, in the presence of God. It says, we always thank God for all of you making mention of you. Constantly our prayers we recall in the presence of God. And Father, your work produced in faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, for we... By, uh, excuse me, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, he goes on and says that he has chosen you. He knows that they are chosen by God. So what am I saying? I'm saying Paul's life revolved around, was driven by, motivated, energized by God. And when he starts out this letter to the Thessalonians, he just keeps talking about God. Because that's where his heart was. And I'd like to suggest this morning that if, if God is at the center of your life, then a natural result of that will be prayer, right? Because if you're walking daily with somebody, you're going to want to talk to them. And a demonstration you're walking daily with God and spending time with God is that you are going to want to express yourself to God. And so one of the reasons we've given you that little bookmarker this morning is so that you can talk to God about others. So God's clearly at the center of Paul's life, and what really excites him is seeing the evidence of God working in the lives of others, especially of his own spiritual children, those he's led to Christ himself. So in verse 2, it says he's always, we always, excuse me, including Silas and Timothy, we always thank God for all of you making mention of you constantly in our prayers. First thing, thanking God for them. When did he do that? Always. He was always thanking God for these believers. Now, it's going to make sense as we go through these first three verses why that's true. But think about that. He's always thanking God about other believers. And he's thanking God about all of them. He is just excited about what God is doing. And, and the bottom line is, every time you see a true believer, someone who's following after God, it's a miracle. It's a supernatural miracle that we should be excited about. In fact, we should be ecstatic about it. When we get to church on Sunday morning and gather as believers, this is a miracle. The fact that you're here this morning, the fact that we're singing praise to God together, and that we're sitting around together listening to some guy talk to you out of a book. How does that even happen? Paul says, man, I'm just constantly thanking God for all of you because I know that this is evidence that God is real and that he's at work. He's thanking God. He says, I'm mentioning them to God constantly. You know, intercession is a big part of prayer. When we intercede on behalf of someone else to God, when I pray for you, I'm interceding on your behalf. He says, I'm making mention of you constantly in, a, in my prayers. We are in our prayers. And that's one of the things I want us to do as a church.
So what is Paul recalling here that makes him so thankful? We go to verse 3 and we see this. It says, we recall in the presence of our God and Father, what? Your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is recalling not only actions that are visible, but he's also recalling the driving source of the power and motivation behind these things, which is basically invisible. So the first thing we're going to look at is he's, he's recalling the work, the labor, and the endurance of the Thessalonian believers. He's thinking about what he saw when he was there with them. He was there only for a short time. But even in that short period of time, he recognized this. He saw this. God had changed their lives so much that these things were happening. This work, this labor, and this endurance. Work basically, as you know, is an activity involving mental and physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result. I mean, there was something about them. They were working in order to achieve a purpose or result. We could say like on mission, taking the truth of the gospel to other people so that they could become worshipers and servers. Something you don't do unless you're a believer. And it's work. One of the reasons we don't do more of it is because it's work. And frankly, we can be rather lazy people. He saw changes in their work. Rather than just the normal activities that they had been doing, they now were starting to do new things. And it might include things like just studying their Bible and prayer. Things that you would not do, but things that are work. If I were to say, okay, let's be honest this morning, how many of you read your Bible at least five out of seven days this week and spent some time in the Word and studied? studied? You know, and if we're really honest here this morning, I know that a certain percentage of the people in this room would say, didn't do it. Right? How many of you spent some concentrated time this week in praying for others, interceding for others this week, right? Why didn't we do it? Well, for one reason, it's work. <laughs> it's work. And we have to find time to do that. We have the purpose. It has to be a given that we do. He says, these people are doing some work, and I'm excited about the work that they're doing. He says, not only that, but there's labor. And work can be pleasant at times. I mean, if you love your job, you know, the old saying is find something you love doing and then you never work a day in your life, right? So work can be pleasant and enjoyable if you love what you're doing. But labor implies toil that is strenuous and sweat producing. I mean, this is real work. This is beyond just your average job. I mean, they were working to the point of exhaustion. In fact, we learned that Jesus was so busy ministering to people that he didn't even have time to eat. And Paul said in Acts 20 that he was night and day laboring to help the weak. And so Paul here is like so grateful that these people are willing to go above and beyond and do this abnormal labor. And then he says he's thankful for this endurance. Right? They're enduring. It's not just passive, but an active facing trials and persecutions that come your way. It's not giving up or giving in because you know the fight is worth it. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1.4, he boasts about the perseverance and faith that they have in all the persecutions and afflictions that they are enduring. All right? So he says, there's three things about the Christian life that I'm really admiring here. Work, labor, <laughs> and endurance. Wow. Look at all the work you guys are doing. Look at the labor you've undertaken. Look at, look at the endurance that you're exhibiting in spite of all the pressure. You're great people. You're doing so good. I'm so proud of you. Is that, what he's, is that what he's saying here? Well, it, it might be at some level, yes, but we want to peek behind that because the real reason he's so excited and thankful to God is because the actions he observes are evidence of something much bigger. Something else is going on here, something that's more praiseworthy. It's evidence of the supernatural God-given life that drives everything else. See, the Christian life is not a duty-bound, law-enforced, man-centered, works-oriented religion, is it? That's not what's driving us. This is a gospel-generated, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-empowered, joy-filled lifestyle that is linked to God. That's where we live. These people were not motivated and driven by money or praise of men or guilt. They were motivated and driven by the work of God in their lives. They were new people, different people. The truth is, once you trust Christ as your personal Savior, you can never go back. You'll never be the same. 
There's something within you that's, that's creating this desire to know God more and to serve him and to go to church and to be with God's people. There's something there. And that's what he's really rejoicing and being thankful for. The work points to the faith that produced it. And the labor points to the love that motivated it. And the endurance points to the hope that inspired it. This faith, love, and hope that God gives us so that we can serve him. So these are gifts. You say, man, I don't know if I can work anymore or labor anymore. I don't know if I can endure anymore. And in and of ourselves, we can But God has done something in our life and given us something that enables us to do what we beforehand couldn't do. And it stands out. And Paul's so excited about it here as he sees it in their lives. The works, the labor, the endurance are the byproducts of faith and love and hope. And that's what Paul is thanking God for. There's this true God-dependent faith because God's the only one we can truly depend on. There's this self-sacrificing love which says, no, not me, but others. And then there's this no-quit hope. And these are gifts of God. And they come to those who've been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Which, by the way, is the only way that a person can be saved from their sin, right? Christ is the only way. He's the truth and the life. And he's he's the only way, truth, and life. Now, I just heard on the news a couple days ago that the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church made a promise to the, to the Russian soldiers there who were embattled with Ukraine. And he said that to die in war was a sacrifice to save others and that anyone who, was, who would go to war and die in the battle would have all of their sins forgiven. What was he trying to do? <laughs> trying to motivate people to go fight, right? He's a good friend of uh, Putin and uh, He's manipulating religion in order to get people to do something they want them to do. Because you don't get saved from your sins because you go to battle and you die. You get saved from your sins because you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. That's it. Right? But when you do, when you do genuinely put your faith and trust in Christ and he saves you, he gives you the resources that you need to live for him. And sometimes... We drift off, and, we sh- and sometimes, and maybe a lot of times, and we try to live the Christian life in our own strength, and you can't do it. We must rely upon him and what he's done in our lives. Salvation is not work-based. It's by grace, and God gives us these gifts. So, first of all, just look at one verse in each of these, faith. Peter writes, and we looked at this in 2 Peter not long ago, Peter writes, to those who have received a faith equal to ours, Peter says. You receive the faith. God has given you the ability to believe and to trust. It comes from God. And he says in this passage that that faith, that ability to depend on God, then motivates you to work and do things for Christ. Love. John writes, let us love one another because love is from God. Where do we get the ability to love from? We can get it from God. Romans tells us that the Holy Spirit pours out love into our hearts. And so we have this love, which then motivates us to labor. And finally, hope, Peter says, because of this great mercy, we have given, he has given us new birth in a living hope. And when you receive new birth, it comes with a living hope that God gives you. So faith, love, and hope come from God. They're gifts. And those gifts that God gives you is what enables you then to go and live in such a way that demonstrates that your life is driven by God. God does not call us to live a life on our own. He gives us all the resources that we need in order to do it. It's a result of new birth. It's a sign of new birth. The faith produces work. The love motivates labor. And the hope inspires endurance. So, oops. Does your faith, love, and hope, okay, think about yourself personally. Does your faith that you have, your God dependence, and your love, your sacrificial love, self sacrificing love, and your hope, this no quit hope that you have as a believer, if you're a believer, you have it, it's not.
something that God has forgotten that you need. And if you don't have it right now, you don't need it. The gift of love from God, intertwined with that faith, empowers you to love people with everything you have. And we start, we start pointing to your wallet or other things that you have, and people get a little sensitive. But this love that God gives us enables us to love others with everything we have. And then this hope that God gives us establishes a solid ground in our life that supports us so that we can hope in Christ through everything we face. Nothing can come into your life that you can't face and that you can't endure because of the hope that you've had through Christ. So if your idea of the Christian life is, is that it's beautiful and poetic and surreal, Paul kind of counters that here. When he says, no, the Christian life is toilsome, difficult, and rugged. See, that's not really what I signed up for. That's what we get. But in the midst of that, we can have joy. And we can love it. And we can enjoy it. Because God has worked in our lives in such a way that he en enables us and helps us. And he gets the glory as a result. Now, if you think about work and labor and endurance... You're kind of repelled by that, in a sense. I mean, some of you like to work more than others, I get that. But this whole, this combination, <laughs> it, 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 it's the kind of thing that we reject. Our flesh rejects it. I don't need it, I don't want it. But the Spirit of God within us is like an artesian well that just keeps overflowing with hate and love and hope and gives us everything we need. And so that's why we need to be chasing after Jesus. That's why we need to be in the Word on a regular basis so that we are right with him and filled with the Spirit, so that we have the resources that we need to do the things he's called us to do. Our job is simply to trust and obey. I obey God because I know I can, because he's given me what I need. Now, it's an amazing thing to think about this from a human perspective, because Paul was at max with the Thessalonica Christians for a month, max, from what we can read. It says something about two weeks in there. So he, he drops into Thessalonica. God does a powerful work through his word as Paul preaches it. People get saved. Paul is ran out of the town, has to leave. And yet this is the result. A group of people that now Paul is praying about and he's so excited about. Just look at what's going on down there in Thessalonica. And we're going to see more and more of this as we go through this book. Just chapter after chapter of the exciting things that are going on as a result of the work that God is doing. And that's a picture of a healthy church. Healthy people make a healthy church. And as we work on our spiritual health together, we can become healthier as a church, more productive as a church. We can cause people to thank God more for us as a church. And that's the goal. So that people will be drawn to and want to be part of what God is doing. This church was filled with people that were changed by the gospel. And the power of gospel was then seen in their conduct. It was evident in the way they lived. There was a man named James Russell Lowell who lived between 1819 and 1891. He was a Harvard-trained lawyer, taught at Harvard for 29 years, and then was appointed U.S. ambassador to Spain and to England. He was once at a banquet where the detractors were attacking Christianity and its missionary endeavors, and he said this, I challenge any skeptic to find a 10-square-mile spot on this planet where they can live their lives in peace and safety and decency, where womanhood is honored, where infancy, infancy and old age are revered, where they can educate their children, where the gospel of Jesus Christ has not gone first to prepare the way. And if they find such a place, then I would encourage them to immigrate there and proclaim their unbelief there. Why? Because the gospel changes everything. The things we enjoy in life, the sanity that we have in life, it all comes as a result of the gospel. It comes as a result of what God has done in people's lives. Our country has been a great country because of what God has done in the lives of people. People that have put their faith and trust in him. So the question this morning is simply this. What's driving you? What's driving you? When you get up in the morning, what's driving you? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Do you have a 
changed life through trusting Jesus and salvation. In other words, you might be here this morning, you've never trusted in Christ as your personal Savior, and your life isn't changed, and so you are still driven by things other than God. Are you still living in accordance with your old selfish nature, right? That can be changed if you turn your life over to Christ, and Christ can change you from the inside out. But as believers, is your life driven as a result of your faith, love, and hope? And are you working, laboring, and enduring because of that? Is that, what you, is that what's holding you together? Or are you working, laboring, and enduring for temporal things? Right? We mentioned several temporal things. In America, big one's money. Right? You could probably say the majority of people in America are motivated and driven by money. Bottom line, money. Every decision they make comes down to money. And I'm saying, Paul wasn't excited about that. He was excited about people that were working and laboring and enduring because of the faith, love, and hope that they had in their lives. The saying, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, has gotten a lot of criticism in the past because, because people have said, well, you know, it's not all roses. And, and in fact, you know, wonderful life. Is this a wonderful life? Working, laboring, and enduring? And I would say, yes, it is. It is. And that's a true statement. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It may not be your plan. It may not be filled with rose, with rose pellets as you, you know, go out through some beautiful garden and just enjoy life together. But I'm telling you, there's no greater joy than to walk with God and to know that God's in your life and to know that God's leading you and directing you in your life. And if you're driven by that, guess what? You will reach the right destination. You don't have to wonder if you're going to get there. If you're, if you're driven by God, and if he's the motivation of your heart because he's changed you, you will reach the right destination. So what's driving you this morning? Is it the inner work of God? Right? Do you love Jesus with all your heart? Do you wake up praying? Are you praying for others? Are we excited about mission in our area? Do we really believe that the best thing that can happen for anybody in this county is to know Jesus as their personal Savior in a biblical sense? Do we really believe that? Is that driving us and motivating us? So we need to ask ourselves that question this morning. It's our question. Where are you today? Because we can get right back on track if you're a believer. God's welcoming us. He's like, man, I just want to pour out my blessing. But if you're going that direction... You're going to run into some consequences that you won't enjoy. So. Father, thank you for this passage. Lord, it's just kind of a brief introductory passage here, just kind of highlighting that what this church was like. It's a church that was changed spiritually and had changed lives and was recognizable. And Paul was excited about it. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us. Well, we have the resources. You've given them to us. It's not a matter of resources. It's a matter of us surrendering to you. It's a matter of us saying, yes, I will obey you, Lord, and I will, by faith, step out and do things that I may not even feel like I can do. And I will, and I will in that faith, look for ways to love others and, and, and put others first and before myself, which is not something that I'm used to doing. And, and Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this enduring hope that's going to get me through because I know what you've promised and you don't lie. And though this may be tough, the best is yet to come. And so Lord, I pray you would encourage us today, help us to turn back to you, help us to spend time with you, and we ask this in Jesus' name.